Hi everyone. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, so we'll get started with the, the presentation in just a second. Uh, I'll just start by introducing myself. I'll bring the slides right back up as soon as I do. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, uh, my name is Paul Scotchless. Um, I've been in this business for about 25 years working with PCPs. Uh, I've been with PCM for just the last year and a half or so. Um, so I have done training courses all over the world in my in my previous job. So I think I've met a lot of people, in, certainly in Australia, India, other places uh, who might be joining today. Um, with uh, as, as part of that job. So um, I'm hopefully trying to bring some of that experience to you today. So um, well, let's just switch back to the, the presentation here and we'll get started. So our topic today is PCP geometry and high solids applications. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've already introduced myself. I'm just going to point out there's a question and answer panel on your Teams window. Uh, should be on the right hand side. If it's not visible, there might be some icons up at the top corner to open that up. That you're looking for an icon with a little question mark, and you can anytime you have a question, just type it in. Uh, when we get to the end of the, the the session, I will go through and I'll answer all the questions that have been asked. So it'll it'll we'll do it through that that interface. But I'll I'll, I'll come on. I'll come back on and and and, and talk about the, the try to answer those questions live as well. All right, so let's get started here. Um, PCP geometry and high solids applications. So we're looking here at what's the geometry of a PCP and how does that affect its ability to pump solids? This was a question that was asked um, by one of our customers and, and we thought we, we made a good topic for a webinar that we could discuss with everybody. So what is the problem with solids? How does the pump geometry affect it? Uh, how do we quantify that geometry to, to say if it's good for solids or not? I'll talk about the traditional wisdom, um, but there's an alternative hypothesis as well that I'll just mention briefly. Uh, I don't believe in the alternative one. I do. Uh, I think the traditional answer is the correct one. Um, I'll mention a few pros and cons of that traditional solution because nothing in this world comes without a trade-off. Uh, and we'll talk about some other things. You know, I'm going to focus most of this presentation on on the pump itself and the geometry of the pump. Um, and we're going to be talking about so so that geometry affects how likely it is for solids to plug up inside the pump. But you can also get plugging at the discharge or at the intake of the pump. And those have nothing to do with the pump geometry itself. Uh, so we'll talk briefly about those, those things as well. Um, so as I said, we can plug the intake, the discharge or inside the pump. And most of this presentation is focused on the inside. So the appropriate helix angle We'll talk about that in, in a minute. Can help reduce plugging inside the pump by keeping solids moving. If the solids are pushed through the pump, they're not plugged inside it. Um, a good analogy to, to think about for this is this auger or screw conveyor. In Canada, we call this an auger, uh, but I look in Wikipedia, they call it a screw conveyor. So uh, whatever terminology you use, uh, it's basically an Archimedes screw here. Now, a PCP does not work the same way as an Archimedes screw, but in terms of how it moves solids, it's a good analogy to look at. Um, with this screw conveyor, if you have a very tight pitch on it, for each rotation, the, the solids don't move up very far, um, so just one pitch length, but they're much more um, consistent in how they move up. And if there's any obstructions, there's more force that can be applied to keep things moving. If you have a very steep pitch angle, things move much faster, but the slightest bit of obstruction or anything and everything just slides back and it doesn't get moved through, through, the, through the system. So the same applies for a PCP. If you have a shallow angle, we're pushing this, the solids through the pump. If you have a steep angle, you're more pushing them into the side. They're not being pushed up as much. They will go up because there's fluid moving and all that, but they're also being pushed into the elastomer, um, which is not where you want the solids to be, of course. So in general, shallower angle is, is more effective at moving solids. I'll look at the pump intake and discharge briefly later on as well. Um, so just how do we quantify this geometry? PCPs have uh, three 
parameter, well, single load PCPs have three parameters that we use to describe them. Pitch length, uh, rotor diameter, usually minor diameter, and eccentricity. You can put the minor diameter and, and eccentricity together and get a major diameter as well, uh, but it's still, it's, there's still just three parameters there. Uh, the pitch length can be for the rotor or the stator. Uh, in these formulas, I'm using the stator pitch length. Uh, on this, this graph, uh, you can see I've drawn that uh, as two rotor pitches. So for a single load pump, two rotor pitches equals one stator pitch. So to measure an angle, uh, we can draw a triangle here and we have the height is the pitch of the helix and the the bottom there is the circumference of the, the helix, uh, which is pi times diameter basically. Um, and then we can take an arc tangent of the, of the ratio of those two and gives us an angle. So I have a few formulas over on the right hand side here. The first one I've labeled as being the rotor angle. So it has the rotor pitch, which is the stator pitch divided by two, the rotor pitch divided by the uh, circumference of the major diameter of the rotor. So pi times d plus 2e. Um, take that ratio, take the arc 10, you get an angle. We can do the same thing for the stator. So now it's the stator pitch length and the, the, the largest uh, dimension of the outside diameter of the, of, the, of the stator cavity, which is d plus 4e, is now the, uh, the diameter of that. So times pi gives us circumference. Um, you can get this in uh, in some of the, the software that's in the in, that's used in the industry. The the one of the very common tools that a lot of people use has something it displays as being the swept rotor angle. Uh, you have to be careful with that because even though it says swept rotor angle, it's actually displaying this stator angle. Um, if you if you if you want to check that, that that's what it's doing. Uh, some companies out there use something they call a geometry index, which adds in a different factor as well. So this geometry index, you look at the first half of it, p over two divided by d plus two e, it looks very similar to the ratio that we see in the in the rotor angle uh, above, just without the pi in there or the arc tan. Um, so if that's all it was, it would give exactly the same information as the rotor angle, just in a different way. Um, but it does multiply by this d over e as well. Now most piece, most single load PCPs have a d over e ratio that's pretty close to four. You'll see four to six being fairly common, maybe a little bit less than four in some cases. Um, so if they're all fairly consistent, then multiplying by this extra parameter doesn't do very much, doesn't change things a lot. But there are some pumps that do have much larger DOE ratios. So now those ones will have a much higher geometry index uh, than, than other pumps. So there is something a little bit different about that formula. Uh, but whichever of these you use, typically the smaller value is, is, is normally what we're going to see is better for sand. So just comparing these, these um, different values, the first graph I have on the left here shows the rotor helix and the stator helix angle, so those first two formulas. And you can see if I plot a bunch of pumps against those, uh, or those, those two variables, they're very sim they're, they're not the same number, but it's a very tight band. So if I know one of these values, the other one is pretty easy to figure out as well. Uh, there's not a lot of uncertainty there. So yeah, I'm not getting new information by having both a rotor angle and, and a stator angle. If I have one of them, I've got pretty much all the information I need. Um, now, just a, a comment about the points I've got on here. Um, you can't just go onto the internet and find these eccentricity, diameter, and pitch values for everybody's pumps. Uh, it's not out there. Uh, you can't get it out of that, that industry software either. It's all hidden inside there. Uh, so what I've got on here, they're all PCMs pumps, of course, because I have the values for those. And some other pumps, just a few other pumps that I was able to find information for in, in various papers that I could find. And with those ones, they don't have I don't have the exact values. I've just tried to estimate, basically estimate E, D, and P values to give me the numbers they were showing in the, in the, in the published information. That, that I could find. So it's not may not be perfect, but it should be pretty close. Uh, the second graph here is the stator helix angle versus the geometry index. And again, with a few exceptions, we get a fairly tight band there. So we're not getting a lot of new information off of this, but we do have some. The one, those pumps that have a high D over E ratio stand out a little bit. The ones I circled in red have a D over E ratio greater than nine. 
you know, three quarters of the pumps that I've got on here have a D over E that's less than, um, I think it's six and a half. Yes, three quarters of them are less than six and a half. So there's going to be a few other points here that are, they're not circled, um, but they might be bigger than that six, six and a half uh, and stand out a little bit. So some of those ones, those larger angle ones up at the top that stand out a bit, they're probably also in that, those larger D over E ratios. But in general, again, except for those very large D over E ratios, we're not getting much new information here. Lower swept rotor or lower helix angle, lower value of the helix angle gives you a lower geometry index as well, most of the time, with the exception of those, D, those high D over E pumps. So I'm just going to show you a quick comparison. Here's two pumps. These are both PCM pumps. Uh, very similar displacement, 45 versus 48. Um, very different angles. One's 42 degrees and one's 67 degrees. Um, so you can see the, the profiles of those rotors are very different from each other. The 45E has a very aggressive uh, pitch to it. So in a high solids application, that's the pump I'm going to recommend um, out of these two. If I'm picking a pump with this displacement, uh, that's what I'm going to pick. It, it, that, that tighter, that shorter pitch length, smaller angle is going to be better for producing solids. Also for heavy oil, if you happen, you, I think there's, there are other people in this uh, listening in this webinar today from all over the world. Uh, so if, if you're in heavy oil fields, then, then high viscosity usually has the same advantages. Short pitch lengths are also good there. So oh, the traditional wisdom, as I've said already, smaller helix angle, smaller geometry index is better for, for uh, pumping solids. Uh, that, that smaller angle just moves the solids through the pump better. So many manufacturers, including PCM, have designated um, certain pumps as being, uh, as, as having the small angle, the shorter pitch length, uh, or for the companies that use geometry index, lower values of that. At PCM, we call this heavy lift. If you look in our product information, we'll have some pumps that are, are flagged as being heavy lift. Uh, some people call them fat boy. That's a term that's very common in Canada. People will, even though I think it really belongs to one company, people use the term generically to refer to these short pitch pumps in general. Now, the one thing I want to point out is there is not a specific cutoff angle that we used to say above a certain angle is, is, is long and below a certain angle is short pitch. Uh, it really de depends on the displacement and probably a few other factors as well. You can see on this graph here, I've flagged some pumps as being regular and some as being the low angle, your PCM's heavy lift pumps, but also some other pumps that from other vendors that that they indicate are, are, are fat boy type pumps as well. Um, so you can see there's overlap there where there's some of the, the, the pumps that are not flagged like that actually have lower angles than, than the other pumps. So there are other things that go into this uh, decision making as well. Uh, sometimes it's the diameter of the pump, which, which uh, what, what pump series is it in? Uh, things like that could affect this as well. So it's not a it's not a hard a hard rule. Uh, it also depends on displacement. You can see there's a bit of a slope here. Uh, the smaller the displacement of the pump, the smaller that cutoff angle is going to be. And that's just the nature of the geometry you're going to have with smaller pumps versus bigger pumps. Um, so this concept of, of the traditional of wisdom of a smaller angle being better for solids has many, many years of, of very successful field experience uh, all over the world. Uh, decades of experience in Canada with the, the cold heavy oil chops. So it's cold heavy oil production with sand. Uh, so they're producing very viscous oil and producing lots of sand along with it. Uh, and they, the fat boy type pumps, the short pitch pumps have been very successful there. Uh, in terms of the low viscosity applications in places like Australia, we've seen I've seen data as well that that really does support the the traditional wisdom. Perhaps it's not as clear, but it's definitely leaning towards that that um, wisdom as well. Again, shorter pitches generally give you better performance, whether it's high viscosity or low viscosity. If you're pumping solids, short pitch is good. Um, nothing comes for free, of course. So what are the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of, of short pitch pumps? The advantages, of course, moving solids very effectively. Um, give you lower internal velocities. This is particularly important if you're dealing with heavy oil. Uh, 
having low inside velo in low internal velocities is really important for heavy oil. If you're pumping water, it really doesn't matter so much. Uh, shorter pitch means the pump is shorter for the same pressure rating. So that's you know depending on on what size of pump you're looking at, shorter is is often better. Sometimes it's cheaper. Um, so that's that that can be a, a, an advantage, of course, as well. Now some disadvantages. Uh, to have a short pitch and keep the same displacement, your diameter has to be bigger. So these the, they call these foam pumps fat boy because they're they're larger diameter. They're shorter and larger diameter. Uh, so if you're in a tight hole application, small diameter casing, that could be a problem for you. Um, looking at just the, the, the way a pump is constructed itself, the pressure rating per pitch length may be less on these short pitch pumps. Not that much less, but a little bit. Um, so that's something just to be aware of. Just the, the, the geometry, the interaction between the rotor and stator just means we're, it's not capable of carrying quite as much pressure. The seal lines are shorter, so more susceptible to damage as well. If they get some wear happening there, um, that can have a greater effect on a short pitch pump than a, than a, a longer one. More stress in the rubber as well. Uh, and it's out of plane stress because the, the pitch is so aggressive, it's pushing up and down and not just compressing the rubber. It's, it's moving it around in a different way. Uh, again, so you have to be very careful with rotor sizing and things like that. Uh, the performance of the pump may be more sensitive to changes in fit. So going up or down one rotor size may make a bigger difference in a short pitch pump than it does in a long pitch pump. So it's more important to get the right, ro the right rotor fit. Friction torque can also be affected as well. It may in some cases be higher. So again, it's uh, nothing comes for free in this world. We know these short pitch pumps do really well at producing solids, but there is some, some trade-offs there. <clears throat> um, the alternative hypothesis, and I heard this on one of my visits to Australia, uh, one of the guys at a pump company down there uh, brought this up and he said, what if it's not the rotor that moves the solids, but it's the fluid flow that's moving the solids? And if that's the case, with heavy oil, heavy oil carries solids regardless. It's the viscosity is so heavy, it's so thick that it just carries the solids. You don't have to worry about it. So the short pitch pumps do really well according to this guy, because you know, we want to have low velocity, short pitch pump gives low velocity, so everything's good. But he said in Australia, where it's high water cut, perhaps we should be having higher velocity in the pumps to carry, because it's the, he thought the velocity carried the fluid, uh, or carried the solids, sorry. Um, so it's, it's an interesting argument, uh, and I don't have anything to prove it one way or the other, other than, again, the general field experience that I've seen. Uh, there's very little field experience that supports this theory. All the data I've seen leans the other way and says the short pitch pumps is, are better. Uh, and I think the reason for that um, is again the, the velocity in the tubing. If you if you have enough velocity in the tubing to carry solids to surface, you've got a higher velocity inside the pump. So um, the velocity in the pump is almost always going to be higher than the tubing. So if your velocity is high enough in the tubing, it's high enough in the pump. But again, if the if, if it's the rotor that's doing it, then having that shorter pitch helps uh, as well. So again, the field data is 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 certainly everything I've seen is leaning towards the the short pitch uh, uh, theory as being the, the the correct one. Just since I mentioned fluid velocities here, uh, here's a few different tubing and rod sizes there showing. Uh, velocity from about 0.14 to 0.35 meters per second to produce uh, 50 cubic meters a day. Uh, and at that same production rate, your velocities in the inside the pump are somewhere, you know, 0.8 to 1.06, depending on what size of pump you've got. But these are typical sizes of pump you might have if you're pumping 50 cubic meters a day. Uh, if you went to turn down to a really small pump and ran it at 500 RPM, yeah, you'd have much higher velocities inside there as well. But again, it's going to be higher than what we're seeing in the tubing. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example. So if we have, we want a pump that produces 30 to 40 cubic meters a day at 100 RPM. We have a bunch of options. I'm just looking at PCM pumps here, but go to any company's catalog, you're going to see a, a few options as well. Uh, we actually also at PCM have a 40E. I didn't put that on here because its geometry is pretty similar to one of the ones that's here, just with a slightly different pitch angle. Um, so 
to get these numbers to say which tubing it runs in and what the helix angle is and the velocity, I used the industry standard software that everybody uses to, to do that. And, and basically I ran it. If I didn't get a warning message with a particular tubing size, that means it's okay to run it. And I did it that way because the PCM data sheets are, are a little bit conservative. Uh, one thing about the data sheets is they assume you might use a full size coupling on there instead of a slim hole coupling. Um, so it'll tell you to use a bigger tubing size. For all these examples, I ran with a, a slim hole coupling so I could go to the smaller tubing. Uh, and same with the orbit tube or pup joint above the pump. Um, if the software gave a warning about that, um, well, in this case, it's the one pump where the software did not give a warning. I've put that on there. The other ones would all require a, a, a pup joint, uh, a larger joint above the, the pump. Typically, that would be the same size as the pin that's on the, the pump itself. So three and a half for those first two uh, and four inches for the bottom one. So you have one joint or even just four feet of that, that larger size. So you've got a larger diameter there. There could be a little bit more sand accumulating in that. Because it's so short, we don't usually worry about that. Uh, it's not going to really cause any problems, but it's just something to be aware of. So I've got these four pumps. If I'm just going to look at helix angle, quite clearly I'm going to pick the 3080. Uh, it's got the smallest helix angle, 37 degrees, compared to the next, the next one's 44, 45 degrees. Uh, so I'm going to pick that. But what if I, I have small diameter casing? Uh, if I've got five and a half inch casing, four inch NU pin fits with about two millimeters of clearance. Um, they do run that in places like Argentina, but most companies are not willing to, to, to run a four inch NU inside five and a half inch casing. So uh, if you're in that casing size, you're going to you immediately, immediately scratch that one off and we're going to look at the other pumps. So again, there's that trade off of diameter versus a uh, helix angle. <clears throat> so if I look at the other pumps, um, Again, I can go to the two and seven eighths tubing and get the uh, the larger one there. Get three and a half inch pin, 96 millimeters in diameter. I still have to have a decent casing size to run that, but I've got a lot more clearance there. If I'm really stuck in four and a half inch casing or something like that, I'm really going to look at this 35E. Even though the helix angle is really big, um, if I'm in a very tight application, I might not have a choice. So there's always trade offs here. Sometimes the helix angle is not the most important thing. Um, it's one of those things where if everything else works, then you yeah, then you're going to pick the the smaller helix angle. But in some cases, it just might not because of the diameter. Also, with this pump, we're going to have much higher velocity in the tubing. We've got two and three eighths tubing with no orbit tube or pump joint above the the stator there. So it's two and three eighths the whole way up. We're going to have higher velocities. We have much less problems with with plugging in the in the discharge uh, because there's less sand accumulating there. Um, Again, the higher velocity just means you're going to have less uh, accumulation in the tubing. So that if, you're, if your problem is um, plugging at the discharge, I would look at this pump and say, maybe this is more important than the helix angle. If I'm having the pumps that are plugging up inside the pump during, you know, as the pump is running, then I'm going to want to look at the helix angle as maybe a higher priority. So it's a question you have to figure out where, where is it plugging? Is it the intake, the discharge, or is it inside the pump? And that when it's inside the pump, that's when the helix angle is most important. If it's the discharge, then having smaller tubing is probably more important. So again, some things to look at. Pump OD, do we have casing size limitations? If you're in four and a half or five and a half inch casing, it gets a little tight sometimes. Uh, smaller tubing gives you higher velocities, so you have less accumulation of sand in, or solids in your tubing. Um, if you need a pup joint, again, I don't worry too much about that. Uh, it's a little, you're gonna have a lower velocity in that joint, but it's it's only four feet long, six feet long, depending on, on which one you're buying. So probably not a big problem there, but just something to be aware of. And then you got the helix angle. And of course the internal velocity, I'm not worried too much about internal velocity unless I've got really viscous heavy oil. So again, you're choosing this. What's the balance there between the, the pump size, tubing size, and that helix angle. And uh, it's not always an easy question, um, but if you're in tight applications, you might not be able to get the smaller helix angle. So that's geometry. Um, I do want to briefly talk about solids at the intake and discharge. Uh, we could do a whole webinar probably on each of these topics if we if we if there's interest in that for the future. Uh, but I'm just going to just mention a couple things really quickly. If there's plugging at the intake, 
first thing I'm going to suggest is a paddle rotor. It's it's very simple, very easy, not too expensive to add that on to, the, to a pump. Uh, the paddle rotor sticks down below uh, and it breaks up any uh, any slugs of sand coming in. Also during a shutdown, if there's solids sitting at the pump uh, at the intake, it can help stir that up when you restart the pump and get things moving. Charge pumps or, or reverse helix pumps, what they do is they keep a lot of flow moving in the in the annulus. So for example, if you're pumping 50 cubic meters a day to surface, you might have 100 cubic meters a day circulating down between the perfs or around the perfs and the uh, the pump intake. Um, just keep things moving, keep things agitated so you don't get big clumps of sand coming into the intake. Um, of course, when the system shuts off, it's not circulating anymore, so you might have troubles during a, a restart, which I think, again, the paddle rotor is probably better for that. If you have a deep sump, those can be definitely helpful. Um, the deeper the sump, the longer you've got for that before it fills up and, and, and starts causing plugging problems at your intake. Uh, certainly, I recommend that you clean out your sumps during workovers. If you're in the well anyway, clean that sump out. Um, they do eventually fill up, so a sump doesn't save you forever. It just adds time until until you're going to have a problem. So the you know, time is good. Uh, the longer it takes before you have a problem, the better. So again, um, deeper sumps can be good for that. Landing the pump higher in the well, same thing. It gives you more distance uh, at the bottom of the well for the sand to stay away from the pump. Um, but it may introduce other problems. First off, you can't pump the well off as far. If you're trying to pump the well off right down to your, your perforations, then having the pump above that, you, well, you can't pump off below the pump. Um, and you can also introduce more gas into, into the situation, into the pump. So um, if you not, don't have a lot of gas in your wells, that, that's fine. You can run, uh, have the pump running a little bit higher up. But if you do have a lot of gas, then now your pump has to be able to accommodate that. Um, so. Of course, at PCM we have the slugger pump that can help with that, but you're trading one problem for another if you're, if you, when you're doing that. Solids at the discharge, two things to suggest there. Again, I mentioned earlier, smaller tubing. If your tubing diameter is too big, the solids don't move very effectively out and they just kind of hang around in the tubing and, and don't go anywhere. And then when they shut down, all that solids sits on top of your pump. Uh, with smaller tubing, the higher velocity the solids get carried out, you get uh, a smaller amount of solids there uh, waiting to, to fall on the pump. So that's definitely uh, recommended. Um, automatic tubing drains as well, uh, whether we call that an ETD like we do a PCM or some people call them ADVs or there's just other names out there that, that the companies use. There's a few different ones on the market. PCM has a new one that we've uh, that we, we've got on the market now. Uh, all of these products, though, they allow the, the tubing fluid to drain to the annulus during a shutdown so the solids don't settle on top of the pump. Uh, particularly in Australia, with the, the fine silts and clays you're producing there, uh, when those settle on top of the pump, they can make a real plug that's very hard to, to move uh, and it, make it makes it very difficult to restart the system. So by um, having that, the solids drain out to the annulus, it solves that problem. Now, of course, now you're dealing with those solids at the intake instead, but again with a paddle rotor or something there probably very helpful so um, i think those things do work uh, effectively for for draining fluid and, and preventing the solids problems so just to conclude i'll get to the questions in just a moment here um, generally accepted that low angle pumps are better there's lots of different ways out there or at least a few different ways out there to measure that angle it doesn't really matter which one you use but it's important that you use the same measure if I'm comparing com different ones. So if I'm comparing a PCM pump to somebody else's pump, if I'm looking at if one of those companies publishes the rotor angle, one of them publishes the stator angle, maybe another company publishes geometry index, I can't compare those three numbers to each other. Uh, so what I, would, what I would recommend is finding somewhere that gives the same value, uses the same formula for each of them. So the software, that the industry software that's out there that that the people use is very good for that uh, because it's doing the same calculation for each of them. So the general recommendation is pick what displacement pump you want and look for pumps in that displacement and see what rotor angles they might have. And then if, if it's possible, go for the lower one. As we saw in that example earlier, sometimes you know, other conditions apply and, and you're going to have to go to something that's a little bit bigger. 
uh, but it, it, if you know what the range is for that pump size, it's certainly helpful. So again, look at the displacement and look at the the, the angles available for that displacement using a, a consistent measure. And again, we don't define a cutoff for what's a low angle pump. Again, it's that, that comparison for what's in a certain displacement, what's lower, what's higher, and it will be different for different displacements. Other technologies, paddle rotors, charge pumps, ATDs, all very good for um, helping solve problems in solids um, in addition to the low angle pumps. Uh, for maximum run life, there's a lot of other things to consider. Elastomer selection, rotor stator fit, uh, choosing your pump displacement versus speed. Is it better to have a big pump running at a low speed or a small pump running at a high speed? Depending on your applications, some of these go together. You, you know, it could be that one elastomer selection is good for a certain rotor fit, but a different elastomer if you have a different rotor fit. And same with the speed, it might be you know, one elastomer is good for high speed, another one's good for a low speed. So these things all work together and you have to try to, to optimize that, them all to get the best uh, performance for your application. Um, so at this point, I'm going to move on to the question. Uh, already got a number of questions here, so go ahead and keep uh, keep going, um, keep asking questions if, if you like. Uh, I will read through these starting at the top and working my way down and uh, try to answer uh, as many of these as I can. So some of these questions came in earlier in the presentation, so perhaps I, I may have answered some of them uh, later on, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, so the first one says, isn't the choice of elastomer as key as the choice of the geometry as a, of a PC pump? And absolutely, that's that's correct. You know, for all PCPs in any application, not just solids, but whatever application you're in, getting the right elastomer is probably the single most important choice you're, you're gonna make um, in, in, in designing your system. Um, all these other factors go together, uh, the geometry, the elastomer, the fit, this, the, what displacement you're gonna use, what tubing and size, what rod size, all these are important, but to get a good run life, the elastomer really is 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 one of the very key points. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so next question also on the elastomer, uh, soft, medium, hard. Does it how does it factor into the geometry selection of design designing for high solids? Now I don't know that it factors into the geometry selection so much. I mean that short pitch, long pitch. I think that's all. That does that's independent of the elastomer, but certainly in a high solids application, elastomer selection is really, really important uh, because some elastomers will wear faster, some will wear slower. And it's not just this question of how soft, medium, or hard the rubber is. Uh, some of the tests we've done uh, with our elastomers, um, if you just do go to the lab and do a pure abrasion test, you get one set of results. You go to the field, you get a different set of results. So it's not just um softness or that abrasion test that matters you put the two together and you get something different so it's not again it's not uh purely just softness and hardness uh at pcm if you look at our elastomer selection table it turns out that we're generally recommending our elastomers the, the softer ones but that's not necessarily just because they're softer that's looking at some of the other properties they have as well it just turns out that the that the, the two of the softer elastomers are the ones we recommend in the high solids application but again, I'm not going to say that's because they're soft. I think that might be a secondary factor there. Things like that abrasion resistance, the resilience, all these other things matter as well. Uh, do the short pitch pumps also offer better resistance to pump stuck issues due to solids? Um, I think in generally, I'm going to say yes to that. Um, however, if, if the pumps get stuck during a shutdown, and you get a big plug on top of the pump um, that sets in place, especially with those fines setting in place. I don't think it really matters which pump, pump you've got, then you're going to have trouble restarting it. Um, but in terms of during normal operation, um, yes, I think that the short pitch pumps are less likely to get stuck. Nothing is perfect in this world, and you get a big enough slug of sediment coming through your pump, uh, it can, any pump can get stuck. Uh, but I just think it's less likely with the short pitch pumps. Uh, having more eccentricity will be more 
of more elastomer thickness, will the pump be more sensitive to swelling? That's obviously something that you need to, to worry about. So the geometry does affect that swell. Um, and again, I think that swelling is even more critical to deal with in a short pitch pump than it is in a long pitch pump because it can get this out of plane deformation of the rubber. So uh, you definitely want to, to be um, looking at your elastomer selection to make sure you're getting something that swells as little as possible because because yes that certainly can be an effect um but again it's not just the eccentricity we're dealing with we're, we're a shorter pitch and we make the d and the e bigger um and the pitch smaller so it's a question of what's that d over e ratio and how does that affect that 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 the, the shape of the, sw the swollen stator so it's it's not necessarily that the short pitch pumps are, are short pitch pumps are going to have worse swelling but it's just something to, to consider. So it's, it's certainly something you want to look at and, and you want to minimize the swell uh, in any case, really. Uh, will greater stress on the elastomer translate into shorter life? How do we prevent that? Uh, yes, good question. Um, in general, yes, we're going to say higher stress typically leads to shorter life. Not necessarily all the time, if it keep it below a certain level. Really what kills off pumps is temperature. Uh, stress, cycling stress in the rubber builds up temperature and that temperature is what damages the pump usually. So if, if you got enough water going through the pump enough, uh, at a cold temperature, you know, if there's enough difference between the fluid temperature and the elastomer's rated temperature, um, even though there's high stress, you might still get good run life. Um, so again, it's getting things like the right rotor fit and things like that to try to reduce that stress and, and still get good performance. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, it's one of those questions in general, all else being equal, yes, greater stress translates to shorter life, but there's so many other factors in there that affect that. Uh, you can deal with the higher stress under certain situations, depending on what your fluids are, temperatures are, even what your pump geometry is. So um, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a very simple answer. Um, if I had to say all else being equal, the answer is yes, but all else is rarely equal, so. Uh, how do you know if you're getting stuck inside the pump while running? Uh, well, I know there are some companies in Canada that uh, they were monitoring torque on a regular basis or continuous basis through a SCADA system. And they would actually be able to see uh, over time if the torque started climbing up on them, they saw an increase in torque, they would automatically, and sometimes some of these systems were just computer based, the computer would just automatically call a flush by unit to go out to that well and, and do a flush. Uh, to clean it out, try and prevent it from getting stuck before it ever actually got gets stuck. So theoretically, I guess it's possible in some applications to see that if the torque is increasing, that it's possible your pump is might be close to getting stuck. Does that always work? I don't know. Um, I, I certainly know there was at least one company, a couple of companies in Canada that were that were doing that, uh, monitoring torque and watching for that and then doing a flush by when the torque increased so uh, it's possible um, whether it works on in for example the Australian application uh, I don't know but um, it's something to look at yeah watching that torque is that's probably the single biggest thing you're, you've got to, to, to indicate what's happening down hole I never advocate using torque for pump off control uh, but if you start seeing spikes in torque um, that could be or, or significant changes in torque when you know the fluid level is not really changing, um, that's something to look at. And, and certainly if in a sandy application or a high solids application that could indicate plugging. Uh, the next question says, how do you get plug discharge while running? What evidence do you have that it's plug discharge? So again, while running, it's less likely, I think, not to say it doesn't happen, it certainly can. Uh, the discharge, we're usually more worried about during a shutdown because during a shutdown, all the solids in the tubing will settle down on top of the pump within in low viscosity fluid. It could even just be a few minutes. Uh, the really fine stuff might take a little bit longer. Within a couple of hours, it's all sitting on top of the pump. Uh, and then it's really hard to restart. Now, during operation, you certainly can get some plugging, uh, especially if your velocities are, are very low in the tubing uh, above the pump. So if you're running big tubing at really low rates, you just not the salts are, are not being carried out of the well and they can um, they can still 
start plugging up that tubing there. And then you know, even the slightest reduction in rate causes that the solids to fall on top of the pump and then, you, and then you're stuck. So uh, <clears throat> it can happen. In terms of evidence, again, you're watching torque. Um, in terms of what you can actually see in the field, that's about it. Uh, if you're measuring your flow rates and you know what your tubing size is, you can calculate the velocities and, and see if you've got enough velocity to carry that sand. Uh, if, if you know that you're, you're in a very low velocity situation, then you're going to really be monitoring that well to see if it's if it starts to torque up, uh, indicating plugging. Um, agree with all the theory you've presented. It is logical, but what field or bench experience supports this theory? Well, again, that's something, you know, back in my previous employer, uh, I tried to get a project started for people to, to do a test that would uh, they would do this. We didn't. We didn't get that going. At least not while I was there. I don't know if they've managed to do it since. Uh, and and again, I, you know, I mentioned there was this guy in Australia that had that alternative theory, and I can't prove him wrong um, because I don't have that that bench test data that shows it. What I do have is a lot of field data from Canada. However, that's complicated by the fact it's a lot mostly viscous oil. Not all, but mostly viscous oil and. That has, you know, the, the 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 short pitch pumps really have an extra benefit there. So maybe that doesn't apply in Australia, uh, but it's certainly it's some some good data. And I have seen some other data through again a project at my previous employer that that really strongly suggested, didn't prove it, but it suggested that you get better run life with short pitch pumps. Um, obviously, I, I have no way to share that data because it's it's not PCMs. It's it, it's from my previous employer, but I, I can say that the data I saw s strongly suggests that the, the short pitch uh, pumps are better, but it doesn't prove it. So I'd love to see some nice um, lab testing with clear casing and put the different pumps in with a lot of solids and see what happens uh, where you can actually visualize it. I think that would really go a long way towards showing some of the these things. It also show what happens with paddle rotors, what happens with automatic drain valves, etc um you know to see how they work see where the solids go i think you know, there's a lot of uh, lab testing that can really uh, be very helpful but it hasn't been done yet so um that's again i'm left i'm left with the, the data from canada and that run life data that, that i mentioned that suggests that the, the short pitch pumps is are is better for that can smaller tubing size create problems with the solids um if the solids are small enough to go through the pump, then I'm going to say no. Um, now, if someone's going to prove me wrong on that. I know there's every, every time I think I know something in this business, someone will find a, a weird case out there that, that does something different. So I'm going to say in general, no, um, but I'm sure there's an exception out there that someone can point to me, uh, point me to. Um, again, if the, if the solids can go through the pump, uh, I think you, you're not going to have any problems with that getting stuck inside the tubing if you got the, the flow rate. So um, the smaller tubing size gives you more higher velocity, carries the solid out, solids out in, in general. So again, I don't, if you've got some some case where you're seeing smaller tubing causing problem with solids, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, maybe perhaps offline, you can send me a note. Uh, ATD, what does ATD mean? Automatic tubing drain. So ADV is automatic drain valve, same thing, just a different different company's name for it. At PCM, we have these um, uh, the the we call we we have a, a device they call the ATD. Uh, it's just it has a different principle than than the products from some some of the other companies out there. Which brings us to the next question. Someone says, I haven't much, had much success with the ADVs. To be honest, we trialed them in Australia. They have a high propensity of failure. So basically, we're creating a hole in the tubing. Um, so I wasn't intending this to be an advertising session, but uh, the ATD from um, PCM works in a very different principle. There's nothing on the rod string. Uh, there's no spring loaded valve. It's basically just through the torque of the pump during normal operation and during backspin, it's, it slides a rotating uh, sleeve open and closed. Uh, so so it's, it's much slimmer. You don't have anything inside the flow path other than the rod that's normally there. There's there's no other device in there that, that can fail. 
Um, again, there's not a spring loaded valve. It's if uh, while the torque is is in the positive direction for normal operation, it closes it and during backspin when the torque's reversed, it opens it. Uh, so it's pretty pretty simple that way. Um, so that's that's a different tool out there. So and again, people have a different experience. Again, I saw some data from 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 the ADVs in Australia and, and again, it was, it was like looking at the short pitch pumps. It's not perfect. Some cases will fail early, uh, but I th from again, maybe you're in a different company, but some of the data I saw suggested that in general, you got better run life out of them. At the same time, you got better run life when you blended the pump higher in the well. Do both even get a, <laughs> you get the best of both worlds. So it's, um, you know, again, nothing's straightforward in this world, but uh, different people have different experiences with those products as well. So I'll just move on here to the next one. Um, how, do, how does rotor fit play a role with the swept angle rotors? Is it fair to assume it have a tighter fit with low swept angle to reduce the slip, which can eventually mean less suspension of the fine particles back into the pump? If yes, what efficiency a pump is recommended at full load? There's a lot of questions built in, <laughs> in into that one there. Uh, rotor fit obviously is very important. Um, everybody I talk to at PCM recommends tighter fits for solids applications, regardless of whether it's a low or, or high angle pump. Um, I don't know how much difference that makes on it. <clears throat> um, yeah, clearly a tighter fit, largely to reduce the possibility of having the, the slip, because when fluid slips back and there's solids there, that's when you're going to have erosion happening inside the pump uh, and creating uh, wear on the stator and on the, and on the rotor. Uh, so that's what uh, I think the general wisdom at PCM anyway is to try to avoid. I think other companies may have some different philosophies on that, but uh, I did ask around at PCM to make sure I understood what our philosophy was before I uh, spoke up today. So in general, we're going to say, say it suggests tighter fits. But again, that's with our elastomers. Perhaps with, with somebody else's elastomer, you might get a different answer there. Uh, so I don't want to say that's, that's for sure. Uh, I hope that's answered your question. If not perhaps you can send another uh, note. Um, how can we optimize the selection of swept rotor angle as the lower, the less fluid velocity which cause adverse effect? And how solid sampling and mesh analysis can help in the geometry optimization? Well, I guess you know I'm going to suggest that you want to if you're having a lot of solids problems. First off, you look at where are the problems. If it's the pump itself plugging up. Then I'm going to try and weight that, uh, you know, put the, the swept rotor angle, low, low rotor angle as a higher weight in my calculations. If it's plugging at the discharge, then I'm going to put the tubing size as a higher weight in those calculations. So that's part of it. Uh, but in general, I'm going to suggest I'm going to go with the smaller tubing size. Um, and then within, within the tubing size, I'm able to run for the flow rates that I've got, the fluids I've got. Then I'll pick the smallest rotor angle. Uh, I can find to, that, that fits inside that. Uh, unless, like I said, I've got real problems with plugging inside the pump and then then I'll, I might go to a larger tubing if it lets me run a larger, uh, a smaller swept rotor angle. So again, it's there's a lot of trade-offs in this world and, and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, getting to the second question, how does solid sampling and mesh analysis help? Well, when you do that, it lets you figure out what velocities you need to carry that fluid out. So then you can go back to your, what's your actual velocity in the tubing. Um, so smaller particles typically are more easily carried by the fluid. So you're looking at what are your larger particle sizes. Uh, now, of course, it's the so smaller particles are causing more of the plugging problem. So if you've got large quantities of those small ones, uh, you still want to make sure you're getting those out of the well, uh, but typically, the, the, the smaller ones are more easily carried by the fluid it's the, the, the larger ones that are more likely to accumulate. So you're looking at what well, your larger particle size, you look at like the D90, you have the distribution, what's that size and, and do your uh, settling calculation based on that. And if you can get a velocity that's, people always used to ask me this question, when I was teaching the software that had the calculation in it. You know, if, if I know here's my tubing velocity, here's my sand settling velocity, how much bigger should the, velo the the tubing velocity be than the sand settling? And, and I don't have a, a hard and fast rule for that, but I want to see at least five times and preferably more if it's at all possible. 
um, because I don't want that sand accumulating in the in the in the tubing at all. The, the bigger the difference between those, the less accumulation there's going to be. So having an understanding when you do that mesh analysis and then the settling calculation, getting an understanding of of, of what that means is I think can be very useful. Do I have a mathematical representation linking rod speed with sand settling tendency? Short answer, no. <laughs> um, uh, is it possible that the rods are agitating the, the, the fluid and trying to keep things uh, suspended and moving? Possible, yes. Uh, I have no data on that, no models on that as well. Um, unless you've got like spiral finned rod guides or something like that, the, the, the rod is just spinning circumferentially. It's not moving the sand up or down. Uh, it might just keep it from perhaps forming slugs or something like that, but um, I've seen no data on that and I don't have any models to, to help with that. So um, sorry, I can't give a better answer for that. Oh, here's the, uh, here's a good one. Is a check valve above the pump not sufficient to restart in case of a plug above the pump when used as an ESPCP? Yes, sure. Um, if you're running an ESPCP with no rod string, uh, a check valve is something that a lot of people will do. So um, is it sufficient? Depends on the design of that valve and how much solids are sitting on it. You get all that solids sitting on top of that valve, can the pump generate enough pressure to, to, to open that valve up? It's probably better than having the solids sitting on the pump itself. Um, but you might still, you know, depending on the design of that valve, it might still have some plugging problems. So just something to be aware of. It, it can be done, um, but it's not guaranteed uh, uh, to work. Um, just again, if the solids are plugging off that valve, it might it might not be able to 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 open. But it's probably a good thing to try though. Okay, I think I'm at the end of the questions. Um, if there's any more questions, um, I'm happy to answer them, but uh, I'll just wait maybe a few seconds here and see if anything else comes in. Uh, no, all right. Well, uh, if you have any questions that you want to discuss offline, please send me an email. Um, I emailed the link out to everybody, so you should have my email address. Um, or contact someone at PCM, and we can they can they can forward that to me, or give or or give you my email address if you don't have it. Um, always happy to answer any further questions you might have. The other thing as well, if you have other suggestions for future webinars, what would you like us to talk about that we haven't already talked about in a webinar? Uh, that would be something that would be very helpful to us because we like doing these. We like having this communication with our customers uh, and competitors and anyone else who's interested. It's all good. Um, so if you have suggestions for a webinar topic, please um, please send that send that along to us and we'll try to address that in the future. So at this point, um, thank you very much. Um, depending on where you are in the world, have a, a good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, for me, it's one o'clock in the morning now. I'm about to go to bed. So um, I've enjoyed doing this and, uh, and answering your questions. And um, until next time, Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, does low helix angle increase the, the flow of the solids, but increase where? Um, it's, a, it's a good question, and, and, I, and I think in general, I'm going to say no, um, because the idea is that it doesn't push, the, 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 the low angle pushes the solids up the pump and not into the elastomer. Um, I think that short pitch design it perhaps might be if, if wear does occur, it's going to have a bigger effect on performance, but I think wear is less likely to occur. So a bit of a trade off there. It's not nothing's perfect in this world. Um, but I think you know, we're really trying to reduce how much solids get pushed into the rubber. So I think it, it, it helps move the solids through the pump and therefore it should reduce the amount of wear. Um, but as I said, I think the, you know, as wear occurs, uh, it could have a bigger effect on these low pitch pumps, but it's still the best option, I think, uh, for that. I hope that answers that question. 
Next one, would you expect the characteristics of the solids to play a role in the ability of the pump to move solids effectively? Um, I guess there's multiple uh, ways to look at this. In terms of moving the solids, I would say no. I think solids are solids, they'll, they'll move through the pump. In terms of what damage they do, absolutely. Uh, you can have round particles or you can have very sharp particles. And, and of course, round particles will do very little damage to a pump where sharp ones, if they get between the rotor and the stator, can do a lot more damage. So in terms of what happens with those solids, um, yeah, I think that um, that the, yeah, the, the shape of the solids, absolutely, that's important. Um, in terms of moving through the pump, unless you get to very high quantities, when you start getting the larger quantities of solids, when look at 10, 20, 30 percent sand, then, then, then those sharper ones may tend to stick together more and cause more of a problem than round particles that just bounce off each other. But for smaller um, solids fractions, I don't think it's going to uh, uh, play a role in, in the ability of the, the pump to move to move the solids, although it will certainly affect the uh, uh, how, it, how it wears the pump, what that wear rate is. Are there no more questions? Well, I think we've set a record for the fewest number of questions I've been asked in a webinar. Uh, uh, I'll just, again, I want to thank uh, Benjamin for his help behind the scenes on this. Um, again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. I'll stick around for another minute here, uh, and if there aren't any. Um, but I hope this has been helpful. Um, if you have any topics that you'd like to see us do webinars on in the future, please let me know. Um, OK, we do have another question here, so I'll just finish that, that comment. We'd like to do more of these webinars. Um, next time, we'll, we're going to try and set up the registration process a little bit more smoothly to, to get something that goes right into your calendar immediately. I apologize that that wasn't done. Um, we're going to try to improve on that in the future. Um, all right, we do have a couple of questions here. So does a swept rotor angle play a more important role during startup versus steady state operation? That's a good question. I haven't seen any information on that. Um, one would think that during startup, uh, especially if you've got uh, some solids that are sitting on the pump, uh, the fluid's not moving, it's absolutely going to be the rotor that's, that's going to be moving those, those solids then. So again, that traditional theory that says a lower angle is better, uh, absolutely. Um, so I think that's probably it probably is a more important role there, but certainly during steady operation as well, particularly when you get large quantities of solids going through. So yes, a good question. Um, will the same principles apply for metal pumps? Has PCM tested solids handling in the all metal PCP? Well, the principles will certainly still apply. Yes, uh, geometry is the same. How the fluids move in the pump is exactly the same, whether it's metal or or or, or, or elastomeric pump. Um, at PCM, we typically don't recommend using the metal pumps with really high solids concentrations, just because of wear. The pumps uh, you don't have that resilient elastomer anymore, where a solid can can you know be squished into elastomer and then still become free again uh, without doing much damage. Uh, with a metal to metal uh, pump. Uh, once you get solids in there, it, it can really cause wear and cause the efficiency to come down a lot more. With elastomer pumps, we've got an interference fit between the rubber and the stator. It can wear away a fair bit of that elastomer or, or chrome off the rotor uh, and still have a good seal. Whereas in metal pump, there's, there, there's no interference fit, there's clearance there. And wear just increases that clearance, so it, it reduces the life of the pump. Um, so I'm not worried about the ability of, of solids to go through a metal pump. Ge again, the geometries are the same um, and the same principles will apply, but I am worried about what the sand is going to do on its way through and, 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 and what the effect of that will be on the overall efficiency of the pump. It can do it, yes, but you're going to see a shorter life out of that before the efficiency de uh, degrades to a point where you, where you need to replace it. Um, Oh, there's another one here. Uh, one inch rod can't run in two and three eighths tubing, but would a modified 
API one inch rod. Well, if you're buying the the modified one inch rod with the seven eighths connection on it, uh, yes, you can run that through the the two and three eighths tubing. Uh, but a one inch connection itself, I'm pretty sure you can't run in two and three eighths tubing. Um, that I mean, that answer the question. Yes, in Canada, it's a very common product with the the one inch rod with the seven eighths inch pins on it. Uh, and that is that's great. You can absolutely run that in two and three eighths, especially when you're running uh, slim hole couplings on it. Uh, it's a, it's a, that's a that's a good product for for a lot of PCP applications. So yes, in terms of of, the, of that mount modified product, yes, you can run that. Um, it's not really a PCP question, but in your experience, how do rod guides affect the flow up the tubing? In terms of flow rate with a PCP, what percentage of flow is inhibited due to the presence of the guides? Um, well, the, the guides don't stop the flow in any way. They do introduce a pressure drop, of course. So the question then becomes, how does that pressure drop affect the performance of the pump? Uh, if you're dealing with water, low viscosity fluids, you're going to see the guides have almost no effect at all on the flow rate uh, or on the pump performance. If you're dealing with a very viscous heavy oil, um, a lot of rod guides in the system, you are going to see a higher uh, pressure on the pump and a higher pressure on the pump means a lower efficiency. Uh, but again, with viscous oil, you don't lose very much efficiency. You're going to be putting in more torque, of course. Um, so yeah, there is some some effect there. So uh, you, you definitely want to consider that. What's the effect on the overall system? Uh, how much pressure on the pump? How much torque on the rods? Uh, what is that doing for contact load? And all those those different questions. So yeah, guides absolutely can can do that. It's not, but each case is different, and, and you're going to run that in the software, and you're going to see, like I said, much less effect with with water than you would with heavy oil. And in heavy oil, again, the lower the flow rate, the less of an effect those guides are going to have. Would you run a longer pump in high, higher solids applications to better handle the solids? Uh, the longer pump won't handle the solids better. However, by overstaging a pump, getting more uh, more stage. I, I, if I, I presume that's the question here. If I'm using the same geometry but just putting more stages in the pump, more more pitches in the pump, uh, by having by overstaging the pump like that, you would you get you have more seal lines. So if you get some wear happening later on, uh, the pump can better compensate for that. So that would be the only reason to to do that that I can see. And normally, if I'm running a if I'm running an overstaged pump like that, I'm going to size the rotor a little bit looser as well. Um, so would I do that? Probably not something I would rec normally do, but uh, there are people out there absolutely that, that do that. They'll overstage to, to just give that extra capacity to handle the wear in the future. So if you're if you're having a lot of problems with uh, rotor wear and stator wear, then that's something you might look at. If your problems are that you're plugging the pump up with the intake, the discharge or inside the pump, then making the pump longer is not going to help at all. Do I know of anyone who's run the circulation pumps or charge pumps successfully? Um, yeah, I think I think they do work. Uh, I haven't heard any any anything bad about them. I don't have a specific case study to share with you, but um, I know there are companies out there that do it. Uh, whether it's the the left helix circulation to pump down or just a charge pump that's just circulating, um, the concept is it, it works. It keeps that that fluid moving while the pump is running of course so it maybe doesn't help as much on a, on a startup compared to a, say a paddle rotor um, but yes people have used these successfully for sure it's certainly going to be an extra cost to that because you're putting another pump in uh, and in terms of installation and things like that to make sure if you're able to do that uh, it's all it, it all needs to be considered but it's something that you know the paddle rotor is much much simpler solution but uh, the charge pumps certainly do work does the elastomer type and rotor coating play a role in handling solids through the pump? Um, in terms of handling the solids through the pump, I'm going to say minimal. Um, that softness or hardness of the elastomer might have some effect of whether the, the particles go into the rubber or if they keep moving. But I think overall, in terms of moving through the solids through, I'm going to say that's minimal. Where it does matter is dealing with wear. So if you've got solids, you're going to have pump wear. Uh, and the elastomer type and rotor coatings absolutely will affect what the pump life is uh, in the presence of wear. Uh, so I hope that makes sense, right? You know, you, 
with elastomers, it's it's tricky. Um, is, it, is it a soft elastomer or a hard elastomer? What's better? Uh, there's a balance there. The harder elastomers often have better abrasion resistance if you do a specific lab test for abrasion resistance, but the resilience of the soft elastomers actually works really well to, to reduce the amount of wear as well. So there's a balance there between those, those factors. Um, and different pump companies might give you different recommendations on elastomers. Uh, if you look on a, the PCM website, we, we do recommend which elastomers that we, we sell that are, are best for um, for for handling the solids for again that's more to reduce the wear uh, that's it's not so much moving the solids through the pump but what happens to the solids as they're in the pump or what happens to the pump because of the solids in the pump in terms of wear I hope that answers your question